Discover solutions to issues that affect your family and professional life with practical information to help you get past life's adversities. Take a proactive approach to power up your life with Rosalie's expert resources. According to the Tampa Bay Times, a team of Florida State economists say the unemployment rate and the jobs picture is set to remain bleak through 2016. So what direction is our economy going? A new survey conducted by the Association for Financial Professionals questioned a group of America's preeminent financial leaders to reveal their thoughts on the state of our nation's business and economic climate. Here to discuss these findings is Jim Cates, President and CEO of the Association for Financial Professionals that serves a network of more than 16,000 members. Good morning, Mr. Cates. Good morning. So tell us about the survey and who makes up the Association for Financial Professionals. Sure. We uh, have about 16,000 members, as you've mentioned, and we really are the corporate treasurers, the corporate finance professionals in those organizations. And just think about it as they're the people responsible for managing the cash in their companies and deploying that cash and really have a real understanding of when their companies are going to uh, spend that money and when their companies are going to be holding on to that money. So think about them as the people that kind of have their hands on the cash of uh, corporations. And the direction of how the money's spent? Correct. Well, they'll know how, what decisions are being made and how to deploy and when to deploy that cash. How do you think the climate of political issues will impact the economy as a whole? Well, I think the survey was, was pretty clear looking at uh, tangible evidence that both the fiscal cliff uh, and um, what's going to happen in the long term uh, are very important to our members and, and there's an, one overriding issue and that is uh, our national leaders have got to come to consensus and to address the federal budget deficit. If they don't do that, then companies aren't going to have the confidence to spend that cash. And just think about those of us as individuals, uh, we have to manage our uh, checkbooks and make sure we have enough revenue and uh, enough, uh, and our, rev our expenses don't exceed our revenue, and it's the same in, in companies. The big difference is if companies don't have confidence that we're going to, uh, and our national leaders are not going to address the federal budget deficit, they're just going to hold on to that cash. And that means they're not going to uh, invest in, in plant and equipment, they're not going to invest in job growth, uh, they're not going to invest in those things that are going to spur economic growth. How accurate has the AFP survey been in the past? Well, you know, it's pretty accurate because we also have a what we call a cash indicator, which essentially just says how much cash do the company, are the companies holding in their companies, and that is a real key indicator. And right now, companies are holding on to their cash. So if our members say they're not going to spend that money or see that money being spent for job growth or being spent uh, for additional plant and equipment and additional strategic investments, then you can, you can bet that that's, that is, is exactly what, what's happening out there uh, in corporate America. Where can our viewers go for more information? Uh, www.afponline.org. Florida women who support their families between the ages of 45 and 55, you, as well as all women between those ages, have added stress of facing the symptoms and suffering caused from menopause. Women feel uncomfortable discussing menopause, the symptoms and the treatments to alleviate the suffering. So if you've reached menopause naturally or due to surgical removal of the uterus, and ovaries. The loss of estrogen can result in a variety of physical symptoms. Here to discuss the latest menopause information and treatments is Dr. Michelle Warren, women's health and menopause expert. Good morning, Dr. Warren. Good morning, Rosalie. There's signs and symptoms of menopause that are not the same for all women. Can you explain some of the distinctive differences? Everybody's going to hit menopause, hopefully, sooner or later. The, the symptoms are uh, generally um, hot flashes, night sweats, uh, trouble sleeping, um, sometimes vaginal dryness, uh, muscle aches, moodiness. Moodiness can be a big problem. Um, 
and a joint and muscle pains as well. So there are a variety of symptoms and um, it's, they're fairly common. And about a, a, a quarter of women who go through the menopause will have moderate to severe symptoms. So there's a generation of women that are suffering from these symptoms. And I think it's important to recognize them and to ask doctors about treatment. Um, the symptoms can be fairly severe. Uh, I had a couple of patients lose their jobs. Uh, one had an automobile accident uh, when, uh, because she, wasn't, uh, she fell asleep at the wheel. So they can have major impact. How can a woman decide what treatment options she needs to address her menopausal symptoms? Well, I think it's important to individualize therapy. Every woman is different, and women react differently to different hormones. Um, but the best overall treatment uh, is, is hormone therapy. Uh, and that will relieve the uh, most distressing symptoms of menopause. Um, there are other options. Um, lifestyle, um, exercise, uh, uh, eliminating alcohol, um, that, that can be beneficial. And then there are um, other uh, sort of uh, herbal treatments that generally have a placebo effect, uh, which, are, which are not lasting, but may help in the short term. How about the benefits and the risks that are associated with different treatments? We have 10 years of, of, um, of uh, new data showing that for the most part there are small risks related to um, uh, breast cancer and, and clots, but they tend to be small and if you're under 60, um, it's uh, fairly safe to take hormones, uh, but you have to individualize therapy. Um, the other thing is um, that it's important to ask your doctor about these issues. And if you're experiencing some of these symptoms, you should ask your doctor, do you think this could be menopause? Because very often it's a simple thing to treat. And if you're not happy with the information, you can go to two websites. One is menopause.org and the other one is hormone.org. And both of those websites have excellent information uh, about uh, diagnosis and treatments. And also you can find doctors in your area uh, who are menopause friendly. I call those doctors menopause friendly and have had specialized training in treating menopausal issues. Another thing women dread is housekeeping. More when we return. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified. Not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making home affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Women dread housekeeping. So are you a weekly cleaning warrior or more of a minimalist? A recent survey conducted by Kenmore found nearly half of Americans say when it comes to vacuuming, they cut corners by skipping areas underneath or behind furniture and cleaning only visible dirt, potentially missing 100,000 dust mites on the average square yard of a carpet. Here to add a little humor and reality is accidental housewife and author Julie Edelman to encourage us to clean up for the holidays. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. Nice to see you. Happy almost holidays here. Tell us about the survey and what it revealed about America's dirtiest secrets. 25% uh, of us don't do any kind of cleaning until guests come over. So the holidays are coming. Finally, you're gonna clean. It also says that some people don't do it seasonally. Now, Rosalie, I, as you know, I'm all about doing less is more, but what that does is really build up so much of these allergens, which causes health issues. And actually, when you leave it for so long, by the time you're, you're cleaning, you're gonna work harder and spend more time on that. So that's not something I want. It also said that older people in the survey don't clean their floors as often. And my, my probably because they don't see what's on there, which may be a good thing for some of us not to see all the dirt. So it's really interesting to see how our habits 
are very much, I think, part of our own lifestyle too, of how we're brought up. I mean, I had a mother who was like Donna Reed, if you will, from TV land. And so she would put up almost like velvet ropes. So certain areas never got dirty, but that's a fallacy because even if you're not cleaning, dust accumulates. So what are the right cleaning tools you need to get the job done right? Well, we clearly have some dirty habits, but it's okay. You know, I'm all about minimizing how much we have to do, but doing it by maximizing the tools we use with some tricks, and that's what I'm gonna do here today. Yeah, I mean, the issue with dust mites you mentioned about having 100,000 a square yard carpet, that's pretty scary because that's what causes us to sneeze, wheeze, and all those other things. So we really wanna make sure that we get a vacuum that can actually get all the allergens, the bacteria, but also once we get them, you know, Rosalie, a lot of times we give them right back because they escape from the, um, the canister or whatever else we're using. So what do we want to do? We want to first find a vacuum that treats dirt like dirt, you know? I mean, it's the good old go get them. And that means that you want it to have incredible suction power. And suction power is something they call air watts. So you should get a vacuum with a minimum of 200 air watts. The next thing is, if you have a canister, as I mentioned before, you know, a lot of times when you're emptying it, all the plumes and things, you know, go right back out again or we get them on our face. I don't want to look like a Mary Poppins, you know, the carpet sweeper. So what you want and what I like to do is have a vacuum that has bags because bags make it very simple to empty and they're very manicure friendly, which as you know, I'm all about. Uh, so you just take the bag out, you throw it directly into the trash and you don't have to worry about it. And you want to get HEPA cloth bags because they actually will keep in the allergens, they maintain them, they capture up to 99.97% of all those little dust mites and all that we're getting. Plus it's certified by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. So it's accomplishing all the things I just talked about. So you want to be smart about the kinds of tools you use that they're right for what your needs are. So if you have large spaces, floors, or what have you, or carpeting, get the right vacuum or the right tool to get the job done right. Particularly with the holidays coming, you're gonna have a lot of stuff going all over the place, and I don't wanna clean more often, I wanna clean less often. So share your five top tips on how to banish dirt. The first thing is, with the holidays coming, put mats both outside your entranceway door as well as inside. Because think of like a car wash, most of the dirt and moisture 90% of it you can get off by the time you get to the door. The longer the mat, the better, you know, if you have that kind of room. And then also put one on the inside of any entranceway. Another thing, again, with the holidays right around the corner, have your guests take off their shoes, have an attractive bin, but, you know, be a little festive and have a little, um, if you will, stocking stuffer for them with decorative socks or flip-flops. So you make it sort of a fun thematic party. That's one of them. Another thing is, again, not to allow it to accumulate. Be aware of the hot spots in your home that are dust collectors. And by the way, if you want some more tips, just go to treatdirtlikedirt.com. Julie, thanks for bringing your humor and sharing your tips on how to clean up for the holidays before they come in. He's counting on me. Do we rebuild? How can we go on? I'm so tired. Is it even worth it? I'm not sure I can be strong. How do I find a job? I have a baby picture. The kids' trophies. Child care. Everything is gone. Mommy. About 200,000 children in Florida, that's one in every 13, have food allergies. In the past 10 years, the rate has doubled. One out of 100 children has an allergic reaction so severe it could be fatal without quick intervention. Parents who recognize their child's food allergies look to Florida schools to ensure children avoid foods that will trigger these allergic reactions. Here this morning to educate our viewers about Get Schooled and Anaphylaxis is Dr. Himant Sharma, 
Associate Chief of Allergy at the Children's National Medical Center in Washington. Good morning, Dr. Sharma. Good morning, Rosalie. So Dr. Sharma, what is anaphylaxis? So anaphylaxis is a life-threatening allergic reaction. It can happen sometimes very abruptly without much warning due to a number of different triggers. Uh, you mentioned food allergy and that is the most common cause of anaphylaxis, but other things can do it as well. For example, medications, latex, insect stings. Uh, it's an increasingly common problem, which is why this initiative called Get Schooled in Anaphylaxis and the associated website, anaphylaxis101.com, is so critical. And we're hoping that everyone in Florida goes to the website to become more aware and prepared for anaphylaxis. It's critical that parents really sit down with school staff and let them know what their child's allergies are. You know, avoidance of those allergic triggers is the key first step in managing life-threatening allergies. And so parents should make it clear to school staff what their child is allergic to and then what to do should a reaction occur. There should be a plan in place so that if a reaction does occur, action is taken quickly to keep that child safe. Is it the parents' responsibilities to send their children's lunch and treats to make sure that their children do not have any allergic reactions to foods they may eat at school? So what's recommended is that parents sit down, uh, preferably at the beginning of the school year, and come up with a list of the signs and the symptoms to look for uh, in case a child is having an allergic reaction. It could be things like hives or swelling, uh, problems breathing, uh, problems with the stomach like nausea or vomiting can be life-threatening. So we need to have a list of signs and symptoms to be on the watch for and then a plan. So the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis is epinephrine. So any child who's at risk for a life-threatening allergy should have an epinephrine auto-injector with them at all times, including at school. And the plan should say how to use that medicine and then immediate medical attention should be, t uh, should be taken right after the medication is used. So the plan is important uh, to meet with your school and figure out where exactly it's kept. Many schools will keep it with the school nurse if there is a school nurse, otherwise it might be at the main office. Regardless of where it's kept, it's important that everyone in the school community, whether you're a teacher, a principal, a school nurse, that you know what your role is to play. And that's the cool thing about the website, anaphylaxis101.com. You can actually visit the website and choose which one of those roles you play within the school community and learn the information that's targeted specifically uh, that you need to know. So one of the best things to do is to go again uh, to anaphylaxis101.com. It has a wealth of information about what you can do to make that conversation with the school easier. Uh, and it also has information for the school staff about what they can do to help support uh, children and families through food allergies. It certainly is a scary thing when you think about it, but if we have a plan in place, if we're all aware and prepared, then uh, it's gonna be much easier to keep kids safe and healthy. Florida is a seafood abundant state. So if you wanna taste one of those great tasty catches, but you're on a budget and dining out a lot less often. Don't be intimidated by the variety of seafood choices. Senior Executive Chef Michael LaDuke joins us this morning with some guidance on how to choose fresh, delicious, and affordable meals that the whole family will enjoy during the busy holiday season. Good morning, Chef. Good morning, how are you? I'm just great. Give us some insight on the current restaurant menu trends. I think the biggest trend we're seeing is the is the obvious need for a lot more value on the menus and the need for more variety. So, um, you know, as, as we continue to work and learn from our guests, um, our, our current move, uh, we're launching this, this new menu of ours and the current move is to add more variety. We've added 15 items under $15 and a lot more non-seafood offerings. So that's really the trend that we're reacting to and what we're doing to, you know, give our guests everything they want. So what tips do you have for our viewers on choosing quality seafood at affordable prices? 
But we, you know, as I said, so we launched this new menu today, and it's we're launching the items called our mainstay. So it's 15 items under $15, and now actually 60% of our menu is going to be under that $15 range. So we've got some great things uh, in front. Of, we've got this roasted tilapia and vegetables cooked in parchment paper. It's tilapia, artichokes, asparagus, roasted tomatoes cooked in white wine and lemon. So really great fragrant dish, a lot of great aromas and a lot of great flavor. We've got some new salad offerings, including our Bar Harbor salad. It's a great chopped lettuce with dried cranberries, dried blueberries, pecans, blue cheese. It can be topped with fresh salmon, fresh chicken, fresh shrimp. So great little lighter offering. As well as we've we've really ventured out, we've got a wood grilled pork chop on our menu now to go again after some great killer non-seafood offerings. So wood grilled pork chop, barbecue sauce, apple compote, roasted vegetables. It's really staying under that $15 mark and um, offering some great non-seafood dishes is really where we're focusing this, this whole new change. So for those who prefer non-seafood alternatives when dining out in a seafood restaurant, what do you suggest? We've kept all the great seafood that we had on our menu that people have come to know and expect from us. We've also added more non-seafood items. So our menu now is about 25% non-seafood. Great items like a, a wood fire grilled chicken with mushrooms, the pork chop, as I mentioned, the salad. So we've really tried to venture out so that, yeah, everyone can go. So, you know, bring someone who hasn't been, who doesn't like seafood, and we've got some great offers for them as well. Being a seafood lover, I always wonder why people say, I don't like seafood, but they've never tried it. You know, I think most Americans don't grow up eating a lot of seafood, so it's a little bit intimidating and feels a little bit foreign to them. But there's some great ways to go to, especially a place like Red Lobster, and experiment with some new seafood and try some things that really aren't as scary. So, um, you know, the, the tilapia that I mentioned before, tilapia is a great canvas for flavor. So it's all about the flavors that you pick and then sticking with something that, you know, maybe you think is a little bit recognizable. So, and when you're new to seafood, I would say the best way to get be to try seafood is to actually go out and experience somewhere, not try and cook it at home right away, go out and try some of these great offerings. Any suggestions for those who have special dietary needs when they're dining out? Yeah, we've added we've added some new salads. We've actually added some lighter entrees, our, our island grilled mahi and shrimp with pineapple salsas, 510 calories, so great, great opportunity there. And seafood is naturally healthy anyway, right? So great fresh fish, high in omega-3 fatty acids, lower in calories, so always great um, healthy options on our menu. Each year, Darden Restaurants is a sponsor of Disability Mentoring Month throughout the nation. Here in Florida, they continue to support Archer Disability Foundation's mentoring events from Boca Raton to Vero Beach. Learn more about becoming a mentor at ArcherDisabilityFoundation.org. Florida Independent Living Council's members are appointed by the governor working together with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and Blind Services in a united effort to break down the barriers of everyday life. At a recent disability mentoring event, Rosalie Archer Show teamed up with Archer Disability Foundation at the VA Medical Center, our host for the day. Student mentees experienced hands-on learning with their mentors. The IT department demonstrated basic skills for our mentees that are needed to keep the VA computers performing the needs of a busy hospital and their employees working hard to keep the lines of communication at optimal speed. Valerie Ferris and David Romero were mentors who introduced some job skills needed to work at the Information Resource Management Service, IT, at the VA Medical Center in West Palm Beach. James Oxidine shared what he learned with me. So what I've pretty much learned is how to install certain equipment to the computers, how to fix certain problems by manually going into the computers and fixing it from yours. For those who found law enforcement exciting, Mentees received a tour of the police department and learned what they do each day to keep the patients and visitors secure. Police Chief Tim Caldea presented to Keenu Rivera and Taylor Ferrace the many elements of security at the VA Medical Center's police department. And police dispatcher Randy Herber shared his daily responsibilities with the mentees. The sign shop mentor, Gerald Holmes, from Facilities Maintenance Service, introduced the many communication needs to his mentees, Gary Joseph and Lathanian Evans. For all students and mentees, be handing out a booklet 
on how to apply for the jobs that you want to go for. Dr. Mandy, Chief of Staff at the VA Medical Center in West Palm Beach, presented student mentees and their mentors a certificate of appreciation for their great work achieved during Disability Mentoring Day. The VA, the VA Medical Center's Disability Mentoring Day Committee works hard each year to present a unique career exploration event for all students and mentees to enjoy. We thank each and every one who volunteered their time and effort. To the DMD Committee! The DMD Committee! As responsible parents, we understand the importance of managing our finances and their limitations. To stay informed of our family's possible food allergies to keep them healthy. As women, we embrace our roles as nurturers of the family and need to have a balance between work and home so that we can enjoy our family. If your family can't afford to give gifts this holiday season, considering a planning an act of kindness or a helping hand to a friend, a neighbor, or a loved one. Or consider mentoring someone with a disability who will benefit from your skills. These are life's greatest gifts of all and will only cost you your time. Share your gifts with us at Facebook or go to Rosalie at rosalieartershow.com and send us an email of your blessings. Blessings to you during this holiday season and we'll see you next week. For the solutions to this show's issues, help you or a loved one, find shows like this and others on our website at rosalieartershow.com. <laughs>